And yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. So good to see you guys. Uh, our first pair of Zoom for the year had to be recorded, so I'm glad we can be live today. And um, we heard from everybody um, after the summer trainings and Sonia Suckup talked about ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. And so that's what we are going to be um, focusing on today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And we'll get over there. Okay, so again, we will be talking about these adverse childhood experiences that kind of picked everyone's interest, especially um, when we were talking about trauma. So um, please um, ask any questions as we go through. Um, I'm Steph Lundgren, and of course, Stuart, you're on with me, and we've been doing these for many years together. So I'm gl so glad to see you all there. Um, some objectives for today are listed here. Um, we just really wanna let you know what that trauma and insecure attachment does to brains and, and how the brain function is a little bit different for kids living through those um, adverse conditions. Um, but then also really talk about how can we make this better for kids? How can we adjust things so that they can overcome some of this? So kids do well if they can. If they can't, something is getting in the way. So when you see a student at your school that is struggling, it's because something's getting in the way there. What is it? That's our job as um, adults to figure that out and um, to try to make some um, changes so that they can be successful. What, what is it that's getting in the way of that success? So for some kids, um, you know, it's all flowers, right? Um, they, they can trust and they have a great identity and they feel uh, at conscience and, and they have strong relationships and concentration. But for other kids, there are some weeds that get in the way of that. Um, they might have feelings like I don't belong or adults can't be trusted. I'm in danger or I'm worthless, or no one cares. And when that starts to cloud their thoughts, um, our, our rosy garden um, is also kind of um, interrupted there. So adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, are something that happens between infancy and adulthood to create a lifetime of addictions, abuse, and mental health problems. And there's a study down there from the CDC that you could click on if you wanted some more information on that study. But uh, in this ACE study, um, you know, they really linked it to like, how do these things that happen to kids in childhood uh, affect their experiences um, in adult and their adult health? So um, of 17,000 respondents, two thirds had at least one adverse childhood event. So some of those events could be things like physical and emotional or sexual abuse, emotional or physical neglect, growing up with family members with mental illness, alcoholism or drug problems, family violence, incarcerated family members, one or no parents, parental divorce, it could even be stuff like um, a severe illness in the family. Maybe one of the parents or one of the kids in the family had cancer and that was a big um, issue. Um, so some of these bigger issues that kids have to live through. So um, two thirds had at least one um, ACE. And then again, of those respondents, 17,000 respondents, more than 25% grew up in a household with an alcohol um, or drug user. 25% um, had been beaten as children. Two thirds had one adverse childhood event and one in six people had four or more ACEs. So when we start to think about four or more ACEs, we're just stacking those up and um, it's just increased trauma and increased issues to work through that may get in the way of health later. So compared with people with no ACEs, 
those with four or more ACEs were twice as likely to smoke, seven times as likely to be alcoholics, six times as likely to have had sex before age 15, twice as likely to have had cancer or heart disease, 12 times more likely to have attempted suicide. And look at this one, men with six or more ACEs were 46 times more likely to have injected drugs than men with no history of ACEs. So I think it's just um, pretty eye-opening that those experiences can really lead to some risky behaviors as we grow up. Um, all right, so um, when they even tracked people up to 50 years later, right? Um, compared with people with no ACEs, those with four or more um, were twice as likely to have smoked or um, have cancer or heart disease seven times as likely to be alcoholic, six times as likely um, to have, um, you know, all these risky behaviors here, when I think this is just repeating the slide before, so sorry about that. So when we think about it, what does this look like for us? So untreated ACEs um, exacerbate over time. So in childhood, it can look like developmental delays or expulsion, right? We have those behaviors that lead to expulsion. But in adolescence, then it can lead to um, delinquency, mental health issues, sexual activity, drugs and alcohol and violence. So we see those risky behaviors start. And then in adulthood, it transforms to psychiatric problems, drug abuse, alcohol use, crime. So we see that over time they get worse and worse. And ACEs impact learning. So 51% of children with four or more ACE scores had learning and behavior problems in school. Um, and only 3% of children with no ACE score um, have those same problems. So we see that it causes academic problems and behavioral problems. So let's take a look at trauma, stress, and attachment. So what is traumatic stress? Might be an overwhelming experience that involves a threat, it results in vulnerability and loss of control, leaves people feeling helpless and fearful, and it interferes with relationships and beliefs. And we see a lot of those ACEs we talked about could fit this category. So these are some sources of traumatic stress. I think we can all identify if something's happened to us in our own life or some of these things have happened with our students. We start to see things in here like terrorism and that just makes me think about the videos that I saw coming out of um, the latest school shooting where those kids were having to barricade doors and figure out is that the gunman at the door and escape but that trauma could really be affecting them for a while. But then we think about the kids who have these um, happen over and over and over in their lives. So actually um, the foster care experience um, can be very traumatic for kids. When we think about them, um, you know, being taken from their own families um, and having that sense of loss and um, kind of being uprooted. Um, sometimes that original situation was not a good one for kids and had was um, trauma inducing itself. So that's one source. Um, so the stress response that our body has really is a chemical response. So it prepares the body for action when threat is detected and it helps the body responds to stress effectively. So we can think about fight, flight, or freeze. And I have a video here for us to watch. Humans, like all species, have self-protective mechanisms to help us survive. Our fight, flight or freeze survival response, the FFF for short, is designed to mobilize our brain and body to fight an enemy, run from an avalanche or freeze to hide from a predator. Our brain sometimes misinterprets safe situations as dangerous and can set off false alarms. When the amygdala, our brain's watchdog senses and barks danger. Our body enters survival mode quicker than our rational mind can react, 
leaving it trying to figure out why we feel in mortal danger. When the FFF alarm is sounded, we start to breathe more quickly and shallow, causing hyperventilation, and our heart starts beating very fast. These changes can cause strong chest pain, which many people interpret as symptoms of a heart attack, when in fact it's just a result of the FFF activation, which can be relieved through breathing exercises. As a way of getting you ready for action, blood is diverted towards the major muscle groups. Blood flows away from our digestive system, causing the bladder to relax and we might feel the need to pee. The mouth goes dry, nausea can occur and we get the butterflies feeling in our stomach. Blood also rushes from extremities, leaving us with cold hands but often sweaty palms as the action-ready body starts sweating to avoid overheating. Legs and hands can start trembling and feel weak, while tension starts building in big muscles like the thighs, neck and shoulders. In our head, FFF alarms cause our brain to focus on negative memories, probably so it can scan them to avoid danger and negative outcomes. We get tunnel vision as our pupils dilate to increase our focus and long vision, but as a result we lose our peripheral vision. FFF activation also reduces our ability to recognize differences in facial expressions. Too much oxygen and too little CO2 can result in dizziness or lightheadedness, which many people interpret as signs that they might faint. But because fainting is caused by a drastic drop in blood pressure, and because the FFF increases both our heart rate and blood pressure, it's nearly impossible to faint when this happens. Over time, depression, anxiety, and high levels of stress all harm the brain's ability to slow or cancel false FFF activations, causing them to happen more often. Knowing the symptoms of false activations makes it easier to recognize and reduce their effects. At Tanky Boxing, you can learn both bottom-up and top-down techniques to reduce false FFF activation and bring your body back to balance. Okay, so we see that um, it really is a biological response there. We have cortisol being re released um, when this all happens, when that stress starts to happen. And we all take it just a little bit differently, right? Um, but we are having a biological reaction to that stress. Humans, like all species. Let's see if we can go there. Okay, I went too far. Go back a screen. Um, so when we think about the stress response and trauma, it really um, overwhelms a person's usual ability to cope and all who experience trauma have varied responses. Most recover, some develop more severe difficulties. Sometimes, um, you know, it, it, that stress response though, it is trying to help us through that process of dealing with the trauma. Toxic stress from exposure to violence can impair healthy development. So one study revealed that exposure to relationship-based violence and trauma in the first two years of life resulted in lower IQ scores at five and eight years of age. So we see that it really did um, even affect brain development. And then there's some triggers there, right? So, um, a trigger could be seeing, feeling, or hearing something that remind us of past trauma. Um, I remember hearing one um, behavior consultant talk about how um, she wore lots of different kinds of perfume. And one day, um, a student had an utter meltdown, a student who normally didn't. And um, she started to think about what perfume she was wearing. And that happened to be the same scent of perfume as a um, abusive foster parent for a child. And um, she had to get rid of that and never wear it to school again um, because it was such a trigger that's, and they say scent is most tied to um, memories. So um, that was a big trigger for that student, but it could be seeing something that, that was like trauma or feeling, hearing. Um, my uh, husband's mother um, was killed in a car crash when he was just um, two and a half. 
and she happened to be in the car right in front of him and his father. So um, for a long time, several years, every time he heard sirens, he absolutely melted down. Um, and it was just a reminder of that trauma of, of losing his mom. So um, again, triggers activate that alarm system of something's going wrong here. And when the alarm system is activated, but there's no danger, it's a false alarm. And sometimes I think people say to kids things like, oh, calm down, calm down. There's nothing wrong here. You should just calm down. Um, but the response is like they're having current danger. So um, something triggered them, something reminded them of that tr um, trauma. And it's really not really fair to us to just say, oh, stop it. You know, oh, you need to stop. We need to help them calm down and help them see that there wasn't a, a, a danger there. Um, so um, we have specific skills um, on, for each developmental stage um, to teach how to um, overcome trauma. And children are exposed, or children that have been exposed to trauma invest energy into survival instead of that developmental mastery. So um, maybe they aren't gonna hit those developmental milestones that they should at a certain time. And then um, we see that you know, in school too, maybe some things are behind academically and physically for them. Um, development in adulthood may continue to be impacted that just those um, emotional development um, isn't like it is in um, average folks or folks who have not experienced trauma. So trauma can be a single event or a connected series of traumatic events or chronic lasting stress. Children in the child welfare system almost by definition have suffered trauma, often multiple traumatic events and 50 to 75% exhibit behaviors or symptoms that need mental health treatment. And so I'm so happy to see um, so many services come to kids in school so much more, um, like the licensed mental health practitioners at ESU8 who come out to school. So Stuart, I think you guys are served in that capacity, maybe by Sonia Suckup. Um, and so many more of our schools are. So historical trauma, right? So evidence of that post-traumatic stress disorder across generations. And what they did is they took women who were pregnant um, during the 9-11 attacks, um, and some of them had PTSD from that event. And, you know, it just makes those babies even more um, babies, but grown as they grow up more susceptible to anxiety, depression, and PTSD. So isn't that interesting that we can pass that on? And then we think about attachments. So this is an endur enduring uh, emotional bond. It's biologically driven and it impacts future relationships and self-regulation. So we can have secure attachments or disrupted attachment. So in a secure attachment, um, uh, it provides for the basic um, needs and safety and has the freedom to explore and learn, right? We think of a healthy family and healthy attachment from a, a child to a parent. Um, all your basic needs are met, you're safe, um, you're learning, you're exploring, you know, you're having that developmentally appropriate um, kind of childhood. And then we have that disrupted attachment. So um, lack of availability and predictability, lack of, lack of safety and security, uh, diminished ability to develop those trusting relationships and coping skills. So I think about an ab abusive environment there. So it's very unpredictable. We don't know when somebody's gonna go off and, um, you know, start hitting or um, getting violent. Um, that interrupts our safety, right? And then you can't trust the adults around. Um, or even if there's um, neglect there, you don't, it's not very predictable. When will there be food to eat? 
Um, that's not very safe. That's not, you know, secure of, of having needs met. And then um, you don't know if you can trust the adults around you to get you what you need. And then we work into self-regulation. So this is the um, growth. The growth of self-regulation is a cornerstone of early childhood development that cuts across all domains of behavior. So uh, in other words, it is the ability to balance self-control with self-expression. So I just recently talked to a preschool teacher who said, oh my gosh, I need help with this area because my kids are just so impulsive. They're just doing whatever they want. They've been home for two years with COVID and they haven't had to sit or listen. Uh, so some of it's that inhibitory control. So um, you have, feel this impulse and you want to walk across the room and you just get up and walk across the room. Well, that doesn't exhibit much self-control, does it? So um, we really have to think about um, how kids are progressing in that way. Are they able to um, put aside what they want to do for what they should do in that moment? Um, and sometimes that trauma or those attachments have gotten in the way of that. So some examples of self-regulation, which we've talked a lot in this group about um, uh, executive function and how that's controlled with this top part of the brain and self-regulation is part of that. So establishing sleep and wake patterns, right? Being able to go to bed on time and stay in bed when you're supposed to go to bed or waking up on time and things like that. Uh, increasing intention span being able to sit and listen to a story or um, listen in class and have all attention on the teacher, focusing on a goal, managing emotions appropriately in context. Um, sometimes for kids, it's like, can you be okay even when others aren't okay, even when other things are going on here? Can you be okay for you here? Um, and expressing feelings constructively rather than blowing their top they're able to explain how they feel and why they feel that way. So putting all this together, the biology of trauma impacts the ability for them to self-regulate. So trauma impacts the caregiver-child um, relationship. To heal, children must feel safe in their bodies and they must have supportive relationships with loving caregivers who they can trust. And if coping skills are more developed, a child is much better equipped to handle stress. So we think about that as our role at schools. There's trauma in life and things are happening and maybe they don't have a strong relationship at home. Can we be that for them? But sometimes we have to develop that over time and they have to learn to trust us. And that might take a while if adults typically have not been trustworthy. So the experience of trauma and the impact of it in the classroom. So what does this look like? How does this affect classroom behavior? Well, students who are in, um, who are, have been in foster care receiving child welfare services um, are experiencing some trauma. Students who are or have been homeless, if they've been uh, adjudicated, which means like in part of that, um, court system, um, if they've lived in poverty, um, are unsafe or unsupported communities, or students who experience frequent mobility, they've moved around a lot, they haven't formed those bonds. Um, can we think of anybody else that may be experiencing trauma? Can anybody think? Uh huh. What? I'm sorry. Step parents. Okay, step parents. Oh gosh, I'm a step parent. It I hope like not. foster family. Maybe a step parent was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even reasons. just. Yep. Yep. That those changes, those drastic changes in their lives, that can be hard. Yep. Going from having two parents in the house to having one parent in the house in case of an uh, a divorce. That it's just that change and. And, um, you know, it's emotional. All right, so trauma from that developmental perspective of how kids are development, developing 
Um, so how we address trauma is dependent on the age and the developmental level of students that we're supporting. So no one child will experience that same trauma in that same way or will respond to it in the same way. Everybody's a little bit different. So much of what we do and how we respond needs to take into account not only the kid's age, but the developmental level, but also the behaviors that they demonstrate in response to their adverse experiences. And there's no one right way to respond to anything, right? So we can't, um, I don't know, I think sometimes when we see very strong behaviors happen, we, get, we take it really personally, we start to blame the kid and we have to really think about what they've been through. And sometimes at school, we don't even know what they've been through. We don't know what those traumas are. Um, we have no idea the history and the story. We, we don't know what happens when they go home. So um, I think we really have to think about each kid individually and that, that behavior is just telling you something and telling you a need that they have. So if we look at it from that helpful perspective, rather than, oh my gosh, kid, you tore apart my room and I'm so mad at you and you bit me. And, um, you know, we don't take it personally. Instead, it's feedback for us to help them. There's that phrase that sometimes, um, you know, the most needy of children or of, of love um, ask for it in the most unloving of ways. So. Um, and then through this, um, you know, whether we've lived through trauma or we're dealing with people with trauma, we have to think of these self-care checklists. So that can help people, um, help those who have lived through trauma take care of themselves. Um, and we have really, with Paris, focused on self-care, right? Filling our buckets and things like that over the years. And um, it's really important um, one thing that experts are noticing with kids um, today are sleep and rest are not happening. So um, they're on devices all night long and things like that. that that's a big um, a need. Uh, if we start to think about nutrition and hydration, some of our foods are so processed that they don't um, really give us that nutrition that we need. So um, you know, taking care of ourselves, but also reaching out for help when we need it. And if kids can't learn by the way we teach, then we have to teach them the way that they learn. Okay, so we have to get to them some way. So it, it doesn't have to be one size fits all. It has to be, I'm going to get you the size that's going to, that, and use the strategies that are going to work for you. So that might mean something different for kids living through trauma. And this resource, Compassionate Schools, um, has a lot of resources that you might um, look at. And it says moving from trauma to resilience. And that resilience is that um, uh, knowing I can, I can persevere through this. I can do it. Um, nothing's going to knock me down. I can keep getting up and keep going. Um, and that's another thing we're noticing generationally is that um, the younger generation just isn't very resilient and that. Um, we see them turning to things like violence, like these school shootings. Um, we see them kind of having more of the meltdown um, approach rather than get up and keep going. And some of the resilience, it, it, it takes learning some of those coping skills that we can teach them about um, dealing with their trauma and their attachments and things like that. So um, they took this high school in Walla Walla, Washington. And, um, you know, like, look at that, 2009 and 10. Look at this number of suspensions and expulsions. Holy buckets, that's a lot. And um, they started using a new approach to deal with the trauma um, that Compassionate Schools uses. And look at how that shrunk. The suspensions and the expulsions just shrunk. So I see, I think we can all agree that it is um, beneficial to start approaching things in a different way. If kids are acting in a different way than we're kind of used to seeing in previous generations, we need to respond to them differently and help them through that trauma. So um, this flexible flame, 
framework for trauma sensitive schools um, would include that school wide infrastructure and culture. It's just the way you do things, we're approaching things differently. You would have staff training and uh, linking with community partners. There would be academic instruction for traumatized children and non academic strategies, and also school policies, procedures, and protocols. So maybe we're gonna teach them through these behaviors that they have rather than just suspend and expel. We're gonna teach you through that because that must have been a traumatic situation. And even asking kids, oh my gosh, that must have been a scary time. That was, you know, you really blew up that, that must not have felt good. I'm here for you and I'm gonna help you through this. So resilient children is, um, they are ones who can bounce back from adversity and continue to function reasonably well, despite continuous exposure to risk. Um, resilient youth share that self-esteem and self-confidence. For a lot of kids, we have to learn, we have to teach that. We have to help them learn that. We have to boost that self-confidence. Also, um, sense of self-efficacy. And so efficacy is that belief in their ability to affect their own lives. Okay, I can change this. I can be in charge. I can do something differently. We're going to have a different outcome because I'm setting my mind to being different and uh, being healthy. Um, there's a range of social problem-solving approaches we can use. Um, and... For a lot of kids, it's about having one significant adult in their lives and having that significant connection and healthy connection to somebody, having one adult who's really there for them. And I think about um, some of our mentoring programs like teammates that is so important for kids and really can make the difference. So I think Stuart, you guys have teammates, am I right? I think so. Okay, um, and then also um, an external support system. So it's not just all on them. It's not all on one kid for, to be by themselves, but instead um, I have these other supports outside me and people I can go to and help I can get. And one of those supports and something that's really happening in schools now is um, SEL or social and emotional learning within the school curriculum. So teaching students about their emotions and how to manage them. So there's include all these components. So self-management, self-awareness, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness. Um, I've been seeing things float around on, on social media about, you know, why don't we have um, classes in this for kids? And it really is becoming part of um, curriculum more and more. Do we have questions about the things we've talked about so far? Please go ahead and um, go ahead and unmute and ask questions away. Can you hear us now? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. We didn't know we were muted. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, and we do have um, teammates when you ask that question. Yes, mm -hmm. but um, I don't have any questions. I don't either. No. Any other thoughts about social emotional learning right at the schools? Are you guys seeing anything happening with counseling and things like that at, at school where um, like maybe from the guidance counselor, not necessarily from the LMHPs, but the guidance counselors working on social and emotional learning. Um, I think that's one way that it fits in really nicely at schools where there is like a guidance class every week, you know, to be, really be working on those, but for everybody in the school to be able to talk about those and how to stay calm or stay safe and, um, you know, have positive self-talk and things like that. So, um, you know, how can we teach some of this stuff so that compassionate teaching and discipline principles are here? So always empower, ne never disempower. So we want to empower kids. You can do this. I know you can. I believe in you, you know, those kinds of things. Um, provide unconditional positive regard. 
So every kid knows we care about them. We believe in them. We're always positive with our students. And I think we've talked about that a lot as parents, right? Kind of coaxing them to that positive self-talk. But I'll also for every kid to think, my teacher loves me, my teacher believes in me. Uh, number three, to maintain high expectations. So even though a student's living through trauma, we know that they're, um, they're able to reach great heights, right? We don't say, oh, well, they're from a bad home. So we only expect them to get this high instead of this high, right? Um, we want to really maintain those high expectations and believe in kids. Um, also, check assumptions. Um, I, well, I want to back up to those high expectations. I had a student, um, one of my last years teaching, and he was actually in five different schools in third grade. He, so he started with me and he ended with me. And when he came back, that was like the sixth school, but he was repeating. So um, it was a bad situation why they were moving around so much. And um, I remembered that that student on his um, NWA map test at the beginning of the year was my second highest in math. And he was so smart. And I just made sure he knew it every second of every day. Like I just I would take him aside. You're so smart. You keep trying. You keep doing so many good things. You can do this. You know, I believe in you. And even though I knew that there was a lot of turmoil at home, I maintained those high expectations and made sure that he knew he could do anything. Uh, okay. So number four is check assumptions, um, observe and question. Okay. So we can't always just assume things that are going on. So we can observe, we can ask questions about things, but assuming, you know, makes a, you know what, of you and me, right? That's the phrase. So we need to check those. Um, number five is um, be a relationship coach. Try to help them out. Um, um, try, you know, to coach them in their friendships and what's healthy in a friendship and a relationship. And six, provide guided opportunities for helpful participation. Um, so um, yeah, we lead them through things and we teach them some of those behaviors and some of it's from watching you and guiding them and talking them through things. So we have these domains over here too. So domain one is that safety, connection and assurance of well-being. Domain two is emotional and behavioral self-regulation. We can regulate those impulses. And three would be competencies of personal agency and social skills and academics. So yeah, we don't want kids to lose themselves in all this, right? So that personal agency means that you can be your own person. You can make your own decisions. Um, you have those good social skills and academics. And all, they all lead to that better academic performance and success in school and life. And I think that's what we can all hope for all of our kids. Any thoughts on these skills to teach kids and how maybe you address some of these skills? Anybody can unmute. I think this is the key, right? We can't just recognize that there's been trauma for kids. We have to help them through it. It's our job. Um, and obviously we care about all of our kids. It what's, it's what gets us to work every day. And so this is where if we can teach some of these skills and help them through it, that's where we can make a difference in their whole life. And we can disrupt that usual pattern for ACEs of, of all the unhealthy behaviors in jail and things like that. Stephanie, uh huh. I this, I don't know maybe this, but um, like with paras, I've noticed, and, and we've got a good group of paras here in Stewart, that um, if the students are having a hard time dealing with the teacher at the moment or whatever, I've noticed that, and I think I can probably speak for most of us here, the kids have a close relationship to to the paras here that, um, I don't want to say, 
Absolutely. I think they, they, that little bit one-on-one -on -one connection and communication, right? That Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they can come to us and tell us, or, you know, if they're maybe did something wrong and the teacher's chewing them out, they feel more secure coming to us or talking to us about different things. I've noticed. Absolutely. And, you know, we've talked a lot about relationship building over the years, and that's what you guys do and, and do so well is you're right there one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then hopefully maybe when you have a little bit of insight about that student, maybe you could share that with the teacher too and say, mm -hmm. hey, um, I, I just might share with you a little bit of what was going on there. Or, you know, like as a teacher, I would have really welcomed that and felt thankful that you knew something that I didn't and could fill me in on something. But right. I think that's so nice when they have you to turn to. Plus, sometimes paras are with the students from year to year where the teachers aren't always there. Mm -hmm. Right. Good. So I think, yeah, that being that relationship coach for them and coaching them through and giving that positive talk, um, you know, they say um, the adult's voice can become the children's inner voice, you know, the child's inner voice and the way they talk to themselves. So when we talk kids up and tell them how great they are, then that becomes their inner voice instead of all the criticisms and harping and things like that, that sometimes happen in their lives. Other questions and comments? Oops, I'm going the wrong way. All right, well, um, I just wanna thank you. I'll bring it back to our pictures in case anybody has a question in just a second here, but I just do wanna thank you and say, we'll see you on February 1st. Sonia will be back to talk about some trauma interventions we have. So they might be some of the things we've kind of started to touch on here. Um, remember that we have our website, bit.ly slash pairs of ESU8. So that's where you find the Zoom link to all these sessions. You also find the recorded sessions and the um, slides presentations if you want to access any resources. And as always, please email me if you have any questions at all. I um, welcome them and I love my contact with Paris. It's some of my best days is when I get to see you guys. So I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing and go back to all of our pictures and see if um, we have any more discussion. So anybody else have anything on this topic for us today? Okay, it's pretty quiet out there. Well, I just want to say I wish everybody a very Merry Christmas. Um, what you do is so important, but it's, it doesn't come without a little stress. So I hope each of you takes time over the holiday to um, rewind or unwind and refresh and, um, and get set for that new year. Um, but just enjoy your families and the celebration time. Thank you. You have a good Thanks, Christmas. Stephanie. Thanks, guys. We'll see you soon. See you in February, okay? Bye. Yep. Have okay. A Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.